we will get started. Um, first, a little bit of a housekeeping arrangement. There was uh, a, an unfortunate uh, bit of confusion around the room assignment. So for those of you who are here expecting this to be a workshop on the DNS, you are actually in room one. This, this workshop is for the future of the internet in the context of global scenarios for sustainable development. So if there's anyone who feels that, that they were actually hoping to be in a DNS discussion, this might be a good opportunity to move to room one to see uh, if, if that's uh, where the DNS workshop now is. For the rest of you, welcome to our session exploring the future of the internet. My name is Heather Creech. I'm the Director of Global Connectivity for the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And this workshop is brought to you by IISD, our partner in the workshop, the Association for Progressive Communications, um, the Energy and Resources uh, Institute, Terry of India, who had also uh, quite early on in the, the planning for the IGF, had also proposed a session connecting IGF issues with sustainable development, and they very kindly agreed to merge their workshop with us. Now, unfortunately, I don't think, is Sangeeta here, Sangeeta Gupta? I, yeah, I don't think she's with us this afternoon, but I would like to thank uh, Terry for agreeing to merge their, their interests with ours. In addition, we had the support of Industry Canada and the Government of Finland, Fujitsu and the Internet Society as endorsers for this workshop. Um, and I'd like to thank all of them um, for, for their support for this. IISD has been interested for some time now in Internet governance issues um, because we think that the Internet itself is going to be critical to achieve sustainable development. We don't think that we can get to sustainability unless we have all of the communication systems in place and, and uh, taking full advantage of the innovation that's coming out of the Internet community. We're not going to get to sustainability without it. So we're particularly concerned that all of the issues around the development and deployment of the Internet um, continue to advance. We think one of the ways of connecting these internet issues with global challenges is through scenarios. So over the past year, we've been working out a little bit of a process to take global scenarios that have been developed by organizations like Shell and the United Nations Environment Program and the TELUS Institute looking at those to see how we would try to link those global visions of the future with what might happen with the internet. Will those, will those options for global futures change if there are certain radical changes to how the internet unfolds? And vice versa, will these big global futures actually impact positively or negatively on how the governance of the internet and all of the internet issues uh, unfold. This is a workshop and I'd like to say that this is going to be more work than shop. Um, we actually want to hear from you. So all of you will have been given a, a random paper that uh, assigns you to one of four scenarios. Um, and the intention is to break you out uh, in a few minutes into four groups and you will spend about 40 minutes, 45 minutes thinking about a particular global future and what may happen to the internet within that. At the end, I will call everybody back for the last half hour. Each group will report back on their vision for the future and then we've been joined by four, uh, four discussants who will then comment and respond from their particular perspectives. Our discussant group will be Willie Curry, who is the uh, manager of information communications policy for APC. We have a representative of the government of Finland. We have um, a representative from the Information Technology Association of Canada, and we have Shalini Kali from IDRC to comment as well, the International Development Research Centre. So um, it's going to be an interesting afternoon. We just want people to have a little bit of fun. I know everybody's been sitting in on, 
on fairly uh, intensive panel sessions, so we thought this might be a chance for people to actually do some, some thinking and some, some community work uh, within this workshop. I'm going to ask my colleague, Don McLean, to take us through a bit of an explanation of what scenarios are and uh, just to position you, so in case, for those of you who've never gone through this kind of process before. So I'm going to hand the floor to Don. He's going to talk for about five, 10 minutes, and then we'll break out into groups. So thank you again for coming, and I hope you have a good afternoon. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Just get this the right size. Um, yeah, perhaps, um, perhaps to start with, uh, could I ask a show of hands? Uh, how many people are familiar with scenarios and have worked with uh, scenarios previously? Yeah, a few. Okay. Well, what I'm going to try to do uh, here is a very short introduction to scenario processes for others who may be uh, less familiar with it. As Heather said, they're really stories about uh, the future. Those of you who were in the uh, opening uh, ceremony, uh, I think, uh, would have heard Nitin Desai uh, say that uh, what the Internet Governance Forum is really all about is about the future, it's not the past. The future, but, and there are different ways of uh, thinking about the future of the Internet or, or anything else. One. Uh, technique, I guess, uh, quite common, is to try to predict the future. And that really involves assuming that uh, the trends of the past will continue into the future, can be extrapolated, and that's what it will be like. Scenarios really are not uh, like that at all. They're not predictions about the future based on the past, but they're stories. They're attempts to imagine how the future will be different from the present, because the uh, reality, of course, is that the future is always different. Things always change. So scenarios are a way to try to think about the different directions in which things could change, anticipate different possible futures for the world, and think about how that would affect whatever it is you want to accomplish, whether it's to extend the internet to the next billion or the last billion, as Nitin Desai said, or, as Heather talked about, to achieve sustainable development, whatever that is. As, as Heather mentioned, uh, scenarios have been around for a long time. They've been used by different kinds of organizations. The military, of course, uh, have used them for a long time and wargaming and so forth. In the private sector, uh, Shell, uh, the big oil company, is a very, very famous practitioner of scenario uh, methodologies. Um, they've been used very extensively by think tanks, particularly environmental think tanks and think tanks worrying about sustainable development. And, the uh, scenarios that we're going to be working with today in the workshop are based on work done by the TELUS Institute. That's an offshoot of the Stockholm Environment Institute that I think has been involved in uh, scenario building with a view to sustainable futures for about 30 years. And of course, uh, global public policy organizations such as the UN Environment Program use scenarios. And those of you who are familiar with the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on climate change will know that all of their analytic work and their analysis of, uh, of uh, the impact of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and what that means is based on a very sophisticated set of scenarios. So a very, very well established methodology among environmental policy makers, among sustainable development policy makers, but my, my background is actually in ICT and internet, I think very little used in internet and ICT. Uh, so that's uh, why uh, we uh, wanted to have a look at can we, uh, those of us who work in the ICT and the internet policy community, perhaps learn things from environmentalists and sustainable development people will help us think about the future of the internet. And um, there are different kinds of uh, scenarios that can be used for different purposes. The kind that uh, we're going to work with today are I think generally known as forecasting scenarios. Uh, and uh, forecasting scenarios, the basic question that they look at and that will be ask you, ask you to think about today is what kinds of different futures could result from the interaction of technological, economic, social, and environmental forces, the forces that are shaping and reshaping the world under different assumptions about the kinds of things people value, the kinds of priorities they will set. Is economic growth more important than the environment or does the environment trump everything else, and what are the limitations of future possibilities. So, these, so the idea is to 
think um, multidimensionally about maybe three, four different futures that could result at the end of the day because of the choices people make, because of governance, whether it's governance of the internet or governance of the world. Um, the forecasting approach tends to be quite analytic. It uh, seeks to identify key variables. What are the most important factors that reshape the world? And what are the relationships between them? What drives what? What causes what? Uh, to what extent are we driven by economic considerations? To what extent are we di driven by values and so forth? Um, scenario be building begins with uh, simply telling stories, and that's what we're going to ask you to do today. Uh, constructing narratives, uh, the kinds of stories you have on the sheets of paper of what the world is going to look like at some point in the future, 20 years, hence 50 years, hence and so forth. But uh, generally in forecasting that's only the start of it. Once you've told the story, uh, usually scenario builders then try to take it a bit further by engaging in both qualitative and quantitative analysis of what that world would look like. Usually uh, forecasting scenarios are used to support strategy. In other words, uh, you have an idea of um, what goals you want to achieve in the future. Uh, is it an internet that's accessible freely and openly accessible to everybody in the world? Is it a sustainable future for the economy, society, environment are all balanced harmoniously? And the question is, how do you get there in light of the things that could happen? So it's sort of strategic. It's not really so much thinking about goals as thinking about how do I achieve the goals that I want to achieve in changing circumstances. Um, a word about sustainable development. I think very often when people hear the term sustainable development, they think of environmental issues in general and climate change in particular. It's a big issue today, but in fact, there's a lot more to sustainable development. Uh, it has economic, social, environmental, and governance dimensions. And the, the whole idea is to find the formula that will get them working in harmony to manage not only environmental challenges, but the other kinds of major challenges or crises uh, that will cause things to change, that will pretty much guarantee that the future is going to be different from the past. In this slide, these are drawn from the work of the Telus Institute. Just list some of the things, some of the great challenges, the disruptive forces, the crises that could arise next year, five years from now, ten years from now, that will change the world and need to be thought about. Uh, in fact, <laughs> one of them, financial collapse, uh, perhaps is a kind of a current concern. But the, the idea is one needs to consider not just environmental factors, but a whole bunch of other factors as well. So what do you do with those? Well, this is a uh, taxonomy of the future drawn from the work of the TELUS Institute. And maybe we can follow the flow uh, through from the left to the right. Um, begins with current trends and policies. Where are we now? Where have we been in the immediate past? But the first branch point comes when governance systems begin to confront the kinds of major disruptive changes that were displayed on the previous slide, be they environmental, be they economic, be they political, or whatever. And the question is, how do global governance systems react when they face overwhelming disruptive challenges? And there are three different paths are uh, seen as possible going forward. Uh, the first uh, path, yeah, I guess I'd better stay near the mic. Um, that is a family of scenarios that they call conventional worlds. And this is based on the assumption that even though the world is facing tough challenges, the kinds of governance mechanisms we've developed over, say, the past 10, 20, 30 years will be able to surmount them, will be able to deal with financial crisis, environmental crisis, so forth. And that in some sense, although there'll be a lot of change, as we move into the future, uh, the governance of the globe will be driven by markets, uh, by government. Those are the two main uh, scenarios in the conventional world process. In other words, a continuation of the kinds of uh, governance approaches that have develop, uh, been developed over the past 20 or 30 years. So that's one possibility going forward. A second possibility, the, uh, the middle path, called barbarization, assumes that uh, the crises facing the world, the environmental, social, economic issues, will be so great, so catastrophic, so disruptive, so consequential, that our present governance systems will simply be unable to cope with them. And barbarization is a rather dramatic way to state it. But this family of scenarios assumes really that our governance systems simply are unable to adapt at a global level. Everything 
falls apart. And there are two uh, sort of scenarios in that family. One called a breakdown, just assumes that everything falls apart. We're not going to ask you to work with that one. But we are going to ask you to work with a scenario called based on fortress world, which assumes, and this isn't entirely implausible, and we think of the, uh, the recent tragic events in uh, Mumbai and the other things that are going on, that security becomes an overwhelming concern, and it causes all kinds of barriers to be put up at every level between regions, between countries, within countries, between communities and so forth, so that rather than continuing to evolve uh, in a very open way, the world suddenly begins to close in on itself, that protecting what you've got becomes the top priority, the top value. <coughs> Pardon me. The third possible path forward is what TELUS calls, <coughs> excuse me, it's very emotional stuff. <laughs> The, uh, the great transitions family of scenarios. And the, uh, the assumption behind this is that uh, the severity of the crises, the challenges that face the world uh, cannot be managed by conventional worlds, by continuing along uh, a market-driven approach to governance or a government-driven approach to governance, that they are not sufficient. But rather than retreating into themselves, going into a breakdown or fortress world scenario, uh, people make a fundamental change in what they value and begin to build a world that's very different in the future from the one, say, that we've known for the past one, two, three hundred years, whatever you want to call it, through the modern period. Uh, fundamental change in values that favor harmony between economy, society, and environment and put us on a path to sustainability. Again, there are two uh, scenarios in that family. Uh, one we won't ask you to work with called uh, eco-communalism. This assumes really that everybody, uh, uh, that um, rather than global governance, everything becomes highly localized. The more likely scenario that we'll, we'll ask you to work with is called the new paradigm, or it'll be called, uh, it'll be called uh, global commons. Thank you, Heather, in the papers you've got, uh, uh, assumes that uh, there is an adoption of sustainable governance practices at all levels. And that takes us into a new world. So that's kind of the idea, that uh, major challenges facing the world can put us on different paths. And at the end of the day, it's a matter of choice between values and governance options. Uh, won't go into this in any detail, uh, because I've probably talked long enough. But just to illustrate again from the, uh, the work of the TELUS Institute, that uh, Scenario stories of that kind are typically complemented by qualitative analysis. You know, what goes better under some scenarios and under other scenarios. One of the uh, virtues of scenarios analysis is that, in reality, there is no perfect solution to the, uh, the problems of the world. Uh, to achieve sustainability, you have to make trade-offs between the economic, the social, the environmental, and so forth. And some scenarios will give you better results on certain dimensions than others. What you're looking for is the one that gives the best overall result. That can be discussed uh, quali uh, qual qualitatively, but it can also be analyzed quantitatively. But that gets very complicated, because then you have to select indicators, construct mathematical models, construct databases, and run data series to try to forecast the uh, concrete results in relation to key indicators of governance choices. Anyway, that's we won't ask you to go anywhere near that. All we're going to ask you to do this afternoon is to help us tell four stories about the future of the world and the future of the internet and how they connect. And I think that, that gives everybody a, a, a sort of a, a level playing field on what scenarios are, in particular this idea that, that what we want to do today is to have four stories come out of this process. So I would like now for uh, you to divide up into four groups. And the way we're going to do this is going clockwise around the room. We will have everybody who has a group one handout to come to this side of the room at the front everyone with a group two handout to go there on the, the, the um, right side of the room. Group three, the back corner. Group four, the back corner closest to the door. So if you could now stand up 
move to your part of the room and there will be a facilitator with each group to help you start telling the story. And you have about uh, half an hour. First group, one. on it is it, to the extent that you do put individual machines, um, it very heavily impacts the trade in ICT products, that's for sure, but also the, the flow of free flow of information, and that therefore in, puts in peril um, or retards innovation, which um, thrives at the intersection between cultures, mm -hmm. between disciplines, and just the between world. So when you try to create a monolithic uh, culture and society set of rules, uh, innovation doesn't happen there. So that, that's, you know, that's one way to do it. Just so that we may be 
become very complacent in that happily
is your two minute warning. <laughs> and then I'll invite uh, comments from our discussants. And again, just to reintroduce our discussants group, we have Willie Curry here from the Association for Progressive Communications, Liesl Franz from the uh, Information Technology Association of America. We have Shalini Kala from IDRC, who's based in the Delhi office of IDRC. And we have Yerki Kazvi. Um, uh, maybe you can just take this out of the seat just now. Oh, this one. OK, great. Um, uh, member of Parliament for Finland. So without further ado, I'd like to, to try to keep each of the report backs to about three minutes. So pick the highlights of your discussion, please. And uh, let's start with group number one, which is the um, market, the market for unregulated market forces scenario. Is it on? Okay. Hi, I'm Jamal Shaheen. Um, uh, I've been selected as the rapporteur for Group 1. Um, <clears throat> I think that I will take much less than three minutes because although we had a lot of discussion, uh, I don't have many notes. <laughs> um, so we started off with the idea of the um, unfettered markets, if you like. And uh, we also have somebody here uh, who was in our group, so you will be able to contradict me. Uh, okay, we had the idea, we had the, the unfettered markets or uh, free market approach, and we decided that that was more about a laissez-faire approach from government rather than a specifically rather than a weak government. Okay, so it was the government that was actually had made a decision, or public policy had made a decision to actually leave the markets to control the future internet. Okay. Um, we had several discussions on whether this would make the internet more or less pervasive, uh, whether actually this would increase the number of internet users or decrease the number of internet users. We talked about uh, the role of innovation, being either stifled or not. We had more discussion about that. I think we ended up by saying that innovation would, in fact, be very much stifled uh, in, a, in a system where you had only a few major players who'd swallowed up all the, the, the smaller actors. Um, we also said that this would lead to an internet that marginalized users. So there would be some users that would, of course, not have access because if it's all related just to markets, then there are some people who are not profitable for uh, internet uh, companies. Um, when everything is based on economic decisions, we came up with the idea that um, there, w there would not be an equilibrium. Do, am I... That's right, there would not be an equilibrium, because I've written down equilibrium would be reached, but I think that's my neoliberal tendencies. Uh, equilibrium will be destroyed by the market, that's right. Um, and then we started talking about different types of threats and crises that might happen. We focused on cybercrime specifically. Um, in the issue of cybercrime, we talked about um, some things that are now, uh, under with governmental support, uh, considered illegal might actually turn out to be legalized in the future. Uh, certain criminal activities that we now consider criminal would not be considered criminal under this future internet which where the markets could actually and actors within a market could actually retaliate for each other. Am I taking more than three minutes? Uh, I think that's... Uh, okay. Just about up. Then we had the issue of privacy which would be completely dead. Just a couple more points that I could raise, because we, we did run out of time, just as I'm about to hear. Um, the one thing that I also wanted to raise was the idea of the split in the internet. Maybe we would actually see separate internets being created um, according to quality uh, uh, of usage and, and so on. Okay, that's that. Thank you very much, Group 1. Group 2, which is the policy reform scenario, who, who's reporting back from there? Ah, terrific. 
and again try to keep it to about three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Mohib and I've been chosen just like that one to... Sure? No, it's alright. I don't really mind. Um, so our scenario was where the world is already... Everybody is connected to the internet and we have found, found the ways between government and private sector to, commun to connect and policies are reformed. Um, what would happen in such a scenario? I mean, what would what could go wrong in there? We've we've already got everybody connected and poverty is eradicated. Uh, but if everybody is using their computers to to, to get their, I mean, so connectivity, everyone is a citizen, so they get their education through their palm, um, and they they did they do their business through that. Um, there could be it creates. Uh, form of, uh, we would need forms of redundancy because if things go wrong there will be big chunks of grid that could go wrong. I mean, if they, if we can use today's financial crisis, um, most of it is through big companies and if that is the case, big institutions, major institutions that, that happen, if that's the case where they control a big chunk of the internet um, and, and, and if this financial crisis comes down because we're all connected, the, the, the crisis multiplies. Um, but we, we also discussed about how that could be um, that could be controlled or governed by the government. Uh, we didn't come to a full conclusion on that one, but obviously it was a scenario. Um, Okay, we talked about the security of the, um, the, the you know network information security, I think, and the angle from a crisis. Uh, okay, I think I'm still rolling down. There, there was quite a lot that we discussed, but obviously summarizing it into, I think, trying to find the exact stuff that we talked about. Okay. Um, in, in an ideal world where who controls the net, that was one of the uh, big things we talked about, uh, well, w uh, there will be RFPs that become proprietary and uh, government regulates uh, the oligopoly, I think that's the word, I can't really. Uh, if a crisis hits and this fails, maybe the government controls this uh, and try to stop that from happening, how would the government and governance be at that point? If everything is connected, how would the governments be? And where would um, the boundaries come into place? Um, because everybody is connected to the internet, how would the government governance collaborate with each other to make sure that taxations and all those issues are taken care of properly? Um, I think I think that's about it. That summarizes all of it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks thanks very much. I know it's it. This is really challenging. Often, it's, major scenarios, exercises often go on for two years. So you have these conversations over and over and over again, often for two and three days at a time, rather than trying to compress the whole experience into half an hour. So I think you guys are doing really well, given that we've only given you half an hour to think some of this through. Uh, group number three. Group number three is the, the one that deals with uh, 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 ma major disasters leading to a fortress world and the elites having control. Uh, yes, so yeah, I got drafted for this. Um, yes, this is a fortress world. So this is a place where um, only the elites have access to the internet or connectivity. Um, it's, it's basically a free for all on the outside. Um, and um, so, in general, the, the group decided, I mean, there, there are two key questions, but in, group, in general, the group decided this is bad for the internet and, and in general, bad for society. Uh, and a couple of the, the key questions at the end were, what's the impact on this crisis on the management of the internet? And to that, um, some, some obvious points came, came up. Uh, the management of the internet, uh, the internet may just 
ceased to exist at this point, so that may just go away. Uh, and another interesting point is made is that um, because security becomes such a concern in Fortress World for the elites to keep to maintain control over over their um, their connectivity, uh, privacy concerns go out and, and freedom starts to uh, disappear. Uh, so actually, the people on the outside would have more opportunity for freedom of speech and being able to use the not be able to use the internet, but be able to communicate in ways that would not necessarily be um, encumbered by all the uh, security and the trappings of that. Um, of course, transparency of any management of the internet would be completely gone. That just kind of follows with that. And then the second question was, um, what, what, ha what will happen to your priority uh, internet concern in the future? So people have different priorities there. Um, uh, for example, um, it defeats completely the idea of the internet as being a tool for the non-elites, for the, for the uh, people that don't have uh, all the um, uh, uh, capabilities. And so uh, it completely goes against that whole notion. Um, fundamental idea of, of uh, any cross-cultural um, um, connectivity or any benefits from cross-cultural uh, communication, that all goes out the door as well. One positive reason for actually uh, having a, a uh, uh, fortress world here and a very small controlled uh, internet is that it uh, would allow uh, that group to preserve its cultural identity. It's uh, pointed out and I absolutely agree. You see often that uh, you'll have um, Western cultures um, sometimes having a bit too much influence on, on, on other um, smaller cultures and so the idea here is that you know this, this would be a positive thing. Um, fundamental idea also in the end that um, sustainability, uh, such, a, such a model where only a small group of people have ex extremely secured and, and uh, nailed down uh, connectivity, um, this, is, this is something that, that cannot uh, be sustained for any length of time. Uh, eventually, the lack of creativity in anything like that would uh, evol turn into a, a collapse of that particular um, connectivity, but as well as society as, as a whole, uh, with, with the lack of any creativity there in this kind of Mad Max, if you will, I don't know, <laughs> kind of world. Um, so that's, uh, that's it for group three. Uh, I, I think I've covered most of the main points on, on that. Okay, thanks very much. And last but not least, we have uh, group four, the, the utopian global commons approach. Okay, I was also asked to become part of this experiment and will do my best. Uh, our group has uh, discussed the best scenario where we're happy to have the global commons scenario and uh, we could start from saying that in a sense uh, the internet already is a part of the global commons, it's a public good as it exists now, but certainly there is room uh, for improvement and so we could quickly agree that most of the scenario which was unfolded in front of us was a bit idealistic if not to say utopian and we could agree on that. Uh, otherwise we couldn't agree on too much uh, because there wasn't much time uh, obviously also. So um, with regard uh, to the uh, question of how global crisis can affect the management of the internet, uh, that uh, depends on what global crisis uh, means, in what form it will affect. Uh, the internet, will there be a kind of a real war, will there be maybe cyber war uh, and uh, will this lead for example to censorship and in this way to restrictions of freedom of expression and the internet as we know it. Will there be maybe a tendency towards a fragmentation of the internet where certain regions or powers will cut themselves off um, in, as a result of uh, the conflict. Uh, in any case, uh, it w could be expected that national interests uh, will have a larger say and this could also uh, affect, for example, internet governance in the form of ICANN. With regard to ICANN, we had uh, a bit different views. Uh, uh, some uh, thinking that ICON was on the good path, um, but uh, should maybe uh, take over full responsibility and in that sense 
um, democratize, I mean, the privileged role of United States uh, to go away, and others who thought that the United States are uh, still having a role as a guarantor, a guarantor of the system, um, but uh, that there was some scope for more democratization, bringing other uh, forces or a larger constituency in uh, as well. And I think uh, with regard to priorities, uh, we simply did not get as far. Thank you, thank, thank you very much, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to uh, finish off by getting uh, some responses back from our uh, little group of discussants here, just to get a feeling from them about um, what they've heard and how that affects some of their thinking about the future of the internet. And uh, as Willie gets settled here, maybe I'll ask Willie first to respond. Um, you've been working with us on this process now for, for a few months. Months, Willie, um, based on what's happened this afternoon, have you heard anything new from these stories that either changes your thinking or, or reinforces where you think the internet should go? Well, um, Justin, I was part of the uh, Global Commons group, and um, it was interesting that we we moved into this discussion around um, the role of ICANN, partly because the global common scenario assumes that there will be maximum multi-stakeholder governance. And uh, in a way, we were caught up with the particular history of ICANN as an organization that in uh, under the Clinton administration uh, is an organization that is going to to the government is privatizing the, the um, management of the critical internet resources. Under a Bush administration, it says, well, we want to continue to have an independent ICANN, but um, not transfer the root zone file. And under a, an Obama administration, we don't really know what might happen. But in a way, we were then caught in a, in a problem between um, the actual history and unfolding history and the, the utopia of the, of the global commons, which assumes a multi-stakeholder system of governance. And in that way, it, it became interesting to see how a future scenario was also caught up in an, an unfolding history. Uh, thank you, Willie. Um, uh, Liesl, maybe I'll ask you next for some of your observations. OK. Um, well, first of all, I guess I have an observation that um, this is a very interesting approach to a workshop at the IGF, and it might be um, something for others to think about as as a dialogue, a forum for dialogue like this. I think it brings out some interesting points that were raised by the um, rapporteurs and um, things to think about. Um, so in that spirit, I just had some observations based on the reports, and I didn't participate in, in any of the sessions, any of the groups, precisely so that I would have sort of a blank, <laughs> blank slate. Um, with regard to group one, in the unregulated market forces scenario, I, I guess I was struck by the fact that you said that there might be crimes that would, act, what currently are cyber crimes that would be legalized. Uh, in that environment because currently there are things that we perceive to be cyber crime that are not criminalized under current law and so the law is actually changing to make more things cyber crime so I would have a, I would have expected a different response um, and I also think that the discussion about marginalized users and would privacy be completely dead and um, innovation would be stifled kind of to me the one group that was left out of that discussion was the role of the role and the power of the users of the internet I mean so many things have changed um, um, over time because of what the user behavior is and I think that discussion might have missed that piece of, of uh, um, of the influence, which is a bit ironic to me since there was so much talk about what is good for the users. 
Um, then on group three, in talking about major disasters, I think one the, the most salient point I took out of that is that the balance of security and privacy will continue to be important and will continue to be key, um, no matter what sort of uh, up, uh, scenario we, we, we envision for the future. Um, because if not, then I think there, the notion that the internet would sort of die a slow death if it were um, um, housed in this microcosm of the uh, of the elites would is probably an interesting way to think about not going down that path so it doesn't become this um, useless uh, and therefore irrelevant to society. Um, and then finally, with regard to the utopian global commons, um, one comment that struck me was, well, it depends what the crisis is. And I think the point there is that we need to be as flexible as possible to allow the response and the growth of the internet and the response to it um, be able to morph or respond in a way that makes most sense to the situation and that need to be flexible so that it doesn't, it might bend but it won't break. Thank you, but we might actually follow up with you uh, another time, particularly <laughs> I, I, I'm really taken by how you phrase that, that idea of the internet becoming irrelevant to society if in fact the security issues become so paramount. Um, not that they're not important. Well, not that they're not important, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's a warning signal. And one of the IISD's takeaway messages from all of this process is that these kinds of exercises help us to think through decisions that we might take now that would lead towards a more favorable outcome that, that we would like to see in future. So it's kind of a useful exercise to think through some of these issues. Um, Shalini, again, you're, you're a new person to this process, so I'm, I'm really intrigued to know what, what your, some of your takeaway observations are. Very broadly, um, I'm struck by the fact that I'm surprised, but I guess I shouldn't be, with the diversity of, of opinions and views in all the groups. Uh, our group, we had so much diversity in opinion, and so many new things came up. I mean, we weren't always fighting with each other, but we were just bringing up new ideas, and I was just struck by that. And uh, to me, very broadly, what seems to be uh, the issue here is that if we are if we are talking of, I mean, because one of the things that I thought was that we were we are always thinking of users all the time, probably, or at least I am. But the complexity that that arises because of the users and the potential users, uh, the next billions or the last billions, and 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 all the diversity that is it is going to create. To me, I, th I think it's it's going to be very important how we engage people and all the diverse opinions in where internet goes next. And what is the process that is followed? I, I think that is going to be very important in making a decision about where internet is going. And it's going to take time, just like we learned here. <laughs> we, we, most of us felt that in, in the half an hour or 45 minutes we had, we, we couldn't reach any conclusion. So, so it will be time intensive. It will have its, its costs. But I guess uh, that probably seems to me to be a good, strong, process to look at uh, uh, solutions which will make internet and internet related stuff more sustainable. Thank you. Um, last but not least, uh, uh, Yurki Kazvi, who is a member of parliament um, uh, with uh, Finland and chairs the future of the Finnish parliament committee, which is, as I understand it, like a, th a, a futures think tank. Um, I'd be interested in some of your comments about the value of this sort of future, um, future thinking. Thank you, and uh, I think all these future studies are valuable, and this kind of scenario work gives us very much, uh, let's say, kind of food for the work. This is kind of a very, very good tool for starting future's work. The trouble, of course, is that we had so little time here. It would have would have benefited. Each of these issues would have required a full two, three days of, uh, of work, as you mentioned yourself. 
And it's also pointed out that if you be, uh, are forced to look at these scenarios with quite single-eyedly, like in this, uh, uh, like with these, these time con constraints, we uh, are forced to forget all those mechanisms that would pull these scenarios apart. For example, in our group, we pointed out that uh, that was the license fair group. It was that uh, sooner or later the markets would start to create their own regulative mechanisms because the game theory indicates that if we, we, everybody fights each other, we all will die. Or then uh, this kind of license fair government would soon recognize that the, this experiment, experiment uh, does not work in all, in all fields and then would start to impose regulation on some areas. Uh, it is my strong belief. But uh, there were some other things I'd like to comment. One of these was that what would happen to cybercrime, as you pointed out. If we have uh, this kind of government that does not regulate, say that this is uh, improper behavior, we would soon see trade wars between companies, not between, uh, between nations as we see them now. So that, for example, when Nokia would see that Samsung is creating something threatening, they would start, for example, hit them with a botnet attack or something like that. And uh, this policy reform thing, it was very a good example of how difficult changing the policy is when you ask, everybody says that we need a policy. Then we ask, okay, give me a new policy that we can, uh, we can implement. And then it gets <laughs> very difficult. <laughs> Uh, there was this thing that in many of these scenarios there was this idea that only the elite has access. And I was thinking that uh, wh why would that be? Because market is not interested in the elite. Because elite is small, there is no money in the, in the rich. Because there are so few of them. The money is where, there is lot of, the, money is where the poor are because there are so, so many. So it's always uh, in industry's interest actually to create products and services for the poor because they have more money when you put them together. And uh, finally, this uh, we have been thinking about crisis, but I think that this definition of crisis we have had here has been quite narrow. We have been saying people have mentioned cyber war in several instances, but for example, economic crisis that we are facing. What if it really ends up being something like we had in 1930s? Because that crisis ended up in fascists gaining power in Italy, Nazis gaining power in, uh, in Germany, and many other uh, very, very bad social influences in all around the world. So that is also a crisis that, that would have very big impact in internet and in information society or about the environmental crisis, because that may be uh, the biggest threat to our society or even the human civilization. And lack of resources if we run out of water in big parts of the world and so on, civil unrest, or the global internet outage, because in the early years of the internet we were very, very lucky, because nobody was, uh, nobody of those people who brought the viruses was smart enough to actually write a virus that would have done the job. Because the internet was, was so vulnerable that anybody with enough uh, intelligence, probably people who had enough intelligence to create such a virus, understood not to do it. Because it, but it would have been quite easy to, put, uh, to stop the whole internet. And uh, fortunately, it's a bit more difficult now. But what if somebody makes the virus?